It's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Alvaro Lozano Robledo for our uh, series in the public talk in number theory at the number theory unit at the Center for Advanced Mathematical Science at EUB. Uh, I just want to give a little introduction about Professor, uh, professor Robledo. He's a professor of mathematics at the University of Connecticut, as is currently a visiting scholar at Harvard University. He received his PhD from Boston University in 2004 after temporary positions at Colby College and Cornell University. Professor Robledo has worked at the University of Connecticut since 2008. His research is in the area of arithmetic geometry. He has published two books, Elliptic Curves, Modular Forms and Their L Functions, and a book on number theory and geometry. Uh, Professor uh, Robledo's blog, A Field Guide to Mathematics, contains other short stories and also other pieces of interest to mathematicians. Uh, welcome, Professor Robledo, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you for the invitation to speak here. Uh, it's really an honor. Um, so today what I would like to do is um, some sort of introduction to elliptic curves uh, with some history, uh, but especially just explain uh, the central role of mathematics in mathematics uh, that elliptic curves play. So uh, I'd like to start with a quote uh, by Serge Lang, who was, by the way, my, uh, my academic grandfather, uh, so my 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 advisor's advisor, he wrote in a book that uh, that it is possible to write endlessly on elliptic curves. This is not a threat. And uh, I'll start with the same non-threat that there is so much I, one can say about elliptic curves. So this is just uh, really the tip of the iceberg of um, elliptic curves in mathematics. Um, but what I really wanted to talk about is like, well, I'll, we'll, we'll get in a minute to what are elliptic curves and what they aren't, uh, but we want to talk about like, are they really everywhere? And I, I'll explain that they really, really everywhere in, in very surprising instances. For example, I don't know if you, if you are a gamer or if you have kids that are gamers. In 2010, for example, the PlayStation 3 was hacked uh, and uh, bootleg video games were be able to play it um, on the PlayStation 3. And uh, elliptic curves were to blame or people who didn't know enough about elliptic curves. So this is a good reason to learn about elliptic curves. Similarly, in 2013, there was um, one of the first Bitcoin heists. And, um, and the reason for this, again, was uh, not, a, not a deep knowledge of elliptic curves, in this case, elliptic curve uh, cryptography, which I hope I have a chance to get to uh, today. So, but elliptic curves, they also appear in more mathematical senses in very surprising ways. For example, this number is, uh, well, it's a very large number, it's a, a real number. And uh, by no stretch of the imagination, it should be this close to an integer. This number is a transcendental number that follows by a theorem of Gelfand and Schneider. So, uh, a real number that big that is so close to an integer, why would that be? And it turns out that elliptic curves are to blame. There is an elliptic curve that I'll talk about later that explains why this number has to be so close to one integer. And in fact, it explains why it has to be this close to an integer. But in other circumstances, it is more um, um, a very, very usual things in, in number theory, for example, uh, this polynomial is well known in number theory because it takes prime values for the first 40 values for starting from zero up to 39, you get prime numbers. That doesn't work for 40 or 41, but actually the, uh, the factorizations of those numbers are also interesting. Uh, but the fact that these are all prime numbers it is also related to elliptic curves, to a certain elliptic curve. And it turns out it's the same elliptic curve to blame uh, from the previous slide. So, um, but not, not just that, the uh, elliptic curve, they really appear, of course, in number theory, but they play a central role in algebraic geometry and complex analysis. They show up in topology. They play a surprisingly central role in some of the applications of logic in the 20th century. Uh, and, and uh, nowadays, 
uh, they show up in, in group theory, but also outside of mathematics, they, uh, they show constantly in physics and computer science, in art. So uh, why is that so? So what I want to argue today is that elliptic curves show up in so many places because they are in the sweet spot of some of the very central topics that we study in mathematics, for example, were in arithmetic, in geometry, in complex analysis, in complexity theory, and in some way, and uh, there's uh, the sweet spot of our cognitive ability to uh, deal with mathematical problems. So I'll, I'll talk about that too, and what I mean by that. So for example, so why are they in the arithmetic sweet spot? So in, in particular, what is an elliptic curve? Um, to answer that question, it's actually better to start with the question of uh, what is a Diophantine equation? So we can place the, uh, elliptic curves in their, uh, in their context in terms of uh, number theory. So Diophantine equations are actually some of the simplest equations. They're polynomial equations with integer coefficients. And uh, our interest in these comes from, well, number theory problems or number theoretic problems, where we're trying to find solutions to these types of equations with uh, the values of x and y, for example, here, um, integer coefficients or rational numbers as solutions. Uh, this is um, Diophantis's, the cover of Diophantis's uh, the, arithmet uh, uh, the arithmetica of Diophantus, which has, um, has a lot to do with this topic because so more generally a Diophantine equation is a polynomial, some polynomial in several variables with integer coefficients. And that was the topic of Diophantus's book. So uh, Diophantus of Alexandria who was born around uh, the year 200 of our, our of our era uh, is known sometimes as the father of algebra. And he's known for uh, that series of books I'm talking about Arithmetica. He wrote other books. We know that there are other books he wrote, but they didn't have not survived or we haven't found copies of. And Arithmetica is, uh, it was great because it was the first systematic study of Diophantine equations. And it was used as a textbook of arithmetic. Uh, for quite a bit, uh, quite a long time. And that's, for example, why Fermat was studying uh, Diophantus's book even much later in the 1600s. And uh, well, if you, if, if you get bored, you can take a, a screenshot of this image. And I didn't say when he was, uh, when um, Diophantus has passed away because uh, much later actually Major Doris uh, around the year 500 came up with this epitaph uh, in memory of Diophantus. And this is, uh, the solution goes through a Diophantine equation. And if you solve the Diophantine equation, you'll know how old was Diophantus when he passed away. Okay. So uh, I wanted to give you a, a taste of like Diophantus's problems. These are very typical of what Diophantus's problems look like. So in book four, problem 24, Diophantus asks the following. To divide a given number, into two numbers such that their product is a cube minus its side. Um, nowadays, we would be more clear about the statement of a problem. They are all, the way they are stated, are, they're almost like riddles. Um, but in any case, what Diophantus means is if you have a number A, we want to uh, divide it into two numbers. So two numbers that add up to A. So for example, Y and A minus Y such that the product of these two summons equals a cube minus the side of the cube. And this is our first example of an elliptic curve. Uh, that equation um, defines a, uh, a elliptic curve. And Diophantus actually gives a solution. He finds a solution and he, um, he finds a solution that y equals 26 over 27 works uh, for the number y here. And I'll, I'll tell you how he finds it because it actually, he starts, this is one of the uh, earliest um, instances that we have of like the beginnings of the theory of elliptic curves. So in this elliptic curve for A equals six, this is the, um, this in blue is the equation of the elliptic curve. And what he does is a solution that is actually 
concrete to the number six, to A, B, and six, but it has all the elements of a general solution. And all his problems are of that form that it's some very concrete problem, but the problem is general enough that if you are asked to solve it in general, you can follow his solution to find other solutions to other similar problems. In any case, what he does is uh, he notices that there is a point uh, on the curve, which is the point minus one comma zero, and uses that point to create or to draw the tangent line uh, that goes through that point. And uh, the equation of the tangent line is, well, I'm not giving it here, but you can find the equation just using calculus, which of course there was no calculus at the time of the Diophantus, but still they knew how to do this kind of thing. And, um, and he finds the point of intersection of the curve with the tangent line. And that point, by the way, is going to have rational coordinates um, for, uh, for a reason, because this is a tangent point. So there is um, the number of points of intersection of the line and the curve. It's uh, multiplicity two here. So there's gonna be a third point of intersection, which is this one. And because this is a rational point, it turns out that this is also a rational point. In any case, he finds a solution uh, that x should be 17 over 9 and y should be 26 over 27. Great. So that is uh, our first example of an elliptic curve. And again, uh, that's something that shows up in Diophantus. And um, in general, how do we classify Diophantine equations? So if you want to study Diophantine equations like Diophantus did, what you would do is start and, and this is how the book starts with very basic problems in one variable. And then he starts working with more complicated Diophantine equations. What you would do is, well, uh, we can start classifying Diophantine equations by the degree of the polynomial and also by the number of variables. So let's see how far we can get with that. If we just have one variable and any degree, what we have this equation is just a polynomial equation in one variable, so one polynomial with integer coefficients. And we know how to find solutions to those. Um, then if we find, uh, if we want to study uh, different equations with two variables, so what you get is an equation in two variables, a polynomial equation in two variables, and then you can classify them by the degree of the polynomial. So uh, if the degree of f is one, you get lines in the plane. If the degree of f is two, you get connects and products of lines if it's sort of like a, a degenerate case. If you have a degree of f equals three, you already get into cubics. And this, um, I have it um, underlined in pink because that is already where the sweet spot is going to show up. So there are some degenerate cases for these equations. And then the ones that are not degenerate are the smooth cubics. And it turns out that, um, whether we can find solutions in these uh, cases, it turns out that um, if you go through a basic course in number theory, uh, the tools that you learn as you start with a very basic course in number theory are the tools you need to solve these type of different equations. For example, if you want to find integral points on lines, then what you need to know is um, use uh, the theory of divisibility and actually develop the theory of DCDs of the greatest common divisor to figure out whether there will be integer points on lines. If you want to find points on connects and uh, other equations of degree two, different equations of degree two, it turns out you already need very sophisticated machinery. For example, to figure out if there is a point, a rational point, you need something like what we call the Hasse-Minkowski theory or the theory of like the local to global principle. And to actually find solutions, integral solutions, you need the theory of continued fractions. I'll give you an example in a minute uh, of how to find a point on that uh, conic. But if we go just one step farther to the degree of F being three, if we try to find solutions of a smooth cubics, we are already stuck. So it just seems that number of theorists have been uh, sleeping on the job and we haven't gotten very far in finding solutions, uh, integral or rational solutions of Diophantine equations because we're already stuck with the smooth cubics and two variables. We do not know how to do it. We have conjectural algorithms of how to do it, 
but we have not proved an algorithm that is uh, proved to stop and um, halt and give you a solution. So uh, these smooth cubics are actually uh, where elliptic curves are. So this is the, the sweet spot of the arithmetic in that, well, at the very least is the very first time that we don't know how to find solutions in general. This is an example of an elliptic curve that will come up later also. Okay, so more formally, an elliptic curve is uh, an elliptic curve or a field F. So F can be here, the rationals, the real numbers, the complex numbers, or perhaps a finite field is a, what we call a smooth projective curve of genus one. I'll come back to what genus means um, with at least one point defined over F. So we study elliptic curves. Those are sort of like, uh, it, it turns out that every elliptic curve can be given by a via stress model. So it can be given by a cubic model of this form. If the characteristic of the field is not two or three, for example, over the rationals or the real numbers, you can actually find an equation of this form for an elliptic curve. Um, the smoothness, by the way, uh, it has to be in what we call the projective plane. So we think of the affine plane and then there are some points of infinity that we have to add, and we have to make sure that elliptic curve, that these curves are not uh, uh, not smooth at infinity. Also, so for example, this is an example of a curve that self intersects, so that is not smooth, so that would not be an elliptic curve. Um, this is an example of a, of another curve that uh, is sort of like self intersecting, that there is a cusp, and this it's uh, perfectly smooth in the whole affine plane but there is a, another cusp at infinity. And uh, these actually, these, um, these curves can be dealt with sort of like the lower dimensional tools that we have. So these are not uh, problematic. So they, when the curves are actually smooth, that's when um, we actually do not know in general how to find all the rational points on an elliptic curve of this shape. Okay, so uh, going back to Diophantine equations in general, not just elliptic curves, the solutions can be very intricate and uh, very difficult to find, but we have those algorithms on how to find them. For example, uh, this conic, if you want to find the integral points, the so points with integer coefficients on that conic, well, there is a very simple one, which is one comma zero is a point. But if you want something more exciting, that is uh, both X and Y are not in, uh, not, none of them are zero, so that there are non-zero coordinates, then the very first solution, uh, a very non-trivial uh, non solution of that conic is given by uh, these two very large numbers. And as I said, we know there are solutions and to find them, what you end up using, for example, one way to do it is using the continued fraction of the square root of 61. So the fact that the square root of this 61 can be written uh, the square root of 61 has what we call a periodic continued function, continued fraction. So it's a fraction of this form. And the numbers that we put here in the sort of the diagonal are these numbers. And then once you get to 14, it repeats again and start with one, four, three, one, two, two, and so on. So it turns out that uh, this infinite continued fraction, you can cut it off. So if you do seven, uh, or seven plus one or seven plus this fraction, those are called convergence. And those convergence help you find among one of those convergence or using those convergence, you can find a solution to what we call a Pell equation, which that's an example of. So this is just to say that the Fantin equation, some of the integral solutions are very hard to find, but for degree two, degree one, we know how to do it. Um, there are other Diophantine equations that are extremely hard to find, but that can be reduced to Diophantine equations that we know how to find. So for example, I'm not gonna state here Archimedes' uh, cattle problem. The Archimedes' cattle problem was uh, proposed by Archimedes. I don't know why some sort of like huge challenge to other mathematicians of the time was to, uh, I'm not gonna just state it, but it reduces to uh, this Diophantine equation, which is a system of Diophantine equations, uh, which is, uh, there are two parts to um, Archimedes' problem. This is sort of like solve the first part. And once you know the solution to this, you have to solve the second part. 
and um, it is incredibly difficult to solve. And it was not solved until uh, 1880, I believe. Uh, somebody called Amphor uh, proved that there is a solution and found an actual solution. If you solve the first part of, um, of Archimedes' problem, that actually leads to solve the second part, it leads to a Pell equation, which again, they are complicated solutions, but we know how to solve them. So they did that. And it turns out that the simplest solution to um, Archimedes' problem or how many um, cattle animals you need for the problem to be solvable, it turns out that would, the solution would involve more cattle than there are atoms in the entire universe. Okay, so um, very complicated solutions. More, much more recently, um, we actually did not know if 42 uh, was a sum of three integral cubes, so the cubes of three integers, uh, 42, of course, has a, a role in popular culture through uh, Douglas Adams's books. Uh, 42 was famously the answer to the um, ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. And it turns out that, uh, well, 42 was also special because out of the integers, I think up to 100, there were two integers left to figure out if they were uh, expressible as the sum of three cubes. And uh, in 2019, uh, Booker and Sutherland uh, found a solution, which is um, this large. By the way, this is not an elliptic curve, but it's called what we call an elliptic surface. So uh, it's a family of elliptic curves, in a sense. So why I'm, I'm claiming also that elliptic curves are somewhat in the cognitive sweet spot. And what I mean by this is that uh, there are many problems in number theory and otherwise in other areas of math where our, uh, our power to state problems and problems that we're interested in and problems that we can think about um, and also that are already challenging enough that we uh, that do not have um, a straightforward solution, that is where elliptic curves reside in that sort of cognitive sweet spot of um, problems that are easy to state, but already very hard to solve. So let me give you some examples. Some uh, very natural problem to ask is, for example, find uh, are there any cubes, any integers that are cubes and that are exactly one more than a square? That's something very easy to state that reduces to an elliptic curve. So uh, squares that are one more than a cube. So for example, that's a question that is an elliptic curve. That's uh, a short via stress form, it's smooth. So that is an elliptic curve. And through the theory of elliptic curves, which I will not do here, it turns out that the only uh, squares that have that property are zero, one, and nine. And nine, for example, being eight plus one. And there are no others. And in fact, there are no others uh, even among the rational numbers. So there is no rational number, which is a square, and it's one plus a cube other than these three rational numbers. For example, are there any consecutive non-zero integers whose product is a perfect square? Another natural question that leads to an elliptic curve. So this would be a square that is the product of three consecutive numbers. And the, uh, you can actually do a change of variables. So you get a, a little of a cleaner, equation, so if you change var variables like this, then you get y squared equals x cubed minus x. And that is an example of an elliptic curve. It's an example actually of what I study uh, for my research, which is elliptic curves with complex multiplication, which are elliptic curves with extra uh, uh, symmetries. Okay, so uh, through the theory of elliptic curves, it turns out there are none. Uh, there are no non-zero integers, you see that there are of course, there are solutions, which is, for example, minus one, zero, and one. Those are three consecutive integers whose square is zero, which is a perfect square. But if you require non-zero integers, then in fact, there are no solutions. And uh, in fact, also there is no solutions among the rational numbers other than with a zero in them. Another problem that is very easy to state at our sort of like cognitive mathematical level is that uh, of what we call the congruent number problem. Is there a right triangle with sides of rational length 
Uh, and area six, well, yes, for example, the Pythagorean triple three, four, five gives you a triangle that is right and gives you an area of six, right? Um, how about area five? That is already a challenging problem. And it is in fact, uh, that was solved by Fibonacci in the 1200s as a challenge by no other than the Holy Roman Emperor challenged Fibonacci to find a solution of uh, the problem, congruent number problem for five, and uh, Fibonacci found uh, this triangle, the 20 thirds, three halves, 41 over six. Is one the area of a, of a right triangle with rational sides? It, tr it took all the way to the 1600s for Ma proved that no, that is not the case. And this is in fact, the, uh, this is an application of his theorem, for Ma's last theorem uh, for the case of the exponent four, uh, which is actually the only case of Fermat's theorem that Fermat actually proved. And uh, how about area 157? Well, yes, it turns out that the area of 157, it is the area of, uh, of a right triangle with rational sides. And that was in the, in the 1900s, Zagier uh, proved that that is the case. And it turns out that this problem is related to elliptic curves because uh, N is a, uh, is an area of a right triangle, even only if this elliptic curve has a rational point with y non-zero. So that's uh, a connection with elliptic curves. And for example, for 157, uh, Sagier found a point on the elliptic curve, and then he found the simplest rational uh, side triangle, uh, a right triangle with rational sides, and the simplest such uh, triangle is uh, the ABC with this A, B, and C, which as you can see, is phenomenally complicated. If you cross out right triangles, so how about triangles? Just triangles with sides of rational length and area N. Uh, surely that's a much more general problem and should be related to something more complicated than elliptic curves. It turns out that it also goes down uh, goes to uh, elliptic curve. So a, such a, a triangle with such sides of rational length and area also um, uh, rational, those are called uh, heron triangles. And uh, for example, n equals one is the area of a triangle, not a right triangle, but is the area of a triangle. And this is one example, three halves, five thirds, 17 over six. Euler already knew that um, every number is the area of such a triangle not necessarily right, but one with uh, uh, sides of rational length. And it turns out um, through some work of Goins and Maddox that they are also related to elliptic curves. So a number N is the area of a heron triangle, even only if there is a rational number T, some other parameter, such that this elliptic curve has a rational point with Y not equal to zero. If you put T equals one, then you get the case of right triangles uh, that we saw before. And um, you can, using this connection to elliptic curves, there's one easier way, much easier than what uh, Euler did to prove that every number n is the area of a heron triangle. So here is another problem that is just very, very basic in um, uh, elementary geometry. And uh, that is also very much related to elliptic curves. Of course, for Mott's last theorem, was very much related to elliptic curves and much of the um, fame of elliptic curves actually of in the in the late 20th century and today comes from the connection um, to Fermat's last theorem. So Fermat's uh, last theorem, Fermat claimed in the margin of the book of the Aphantas of the Arithmetica or the Arithmetica that he was reading, he wrote that uh, this equation, sort of like trying to generalize Pythagorean triples to higher exponents, that this equation actually has no integral solutions, um, non-trivial integral solutions. So if x, y, or z are not zero, then there are no other solutions to this equation. It turns out that um, for n bigger than two, of course, for two, there are solutions, for n bigger than two, there are no solutions, or for ma so claimed. Uh, without a proof. He claimed to have a wonderful proof, but almost surely he had an incorrect proof, if any. Uh, at any rate, he um, here is the connection to elliptic curves. For example, the exponent three 
this equation um, over the integers, if you divide through by this z cubed factor, then what you get is this equation. And this equation actually defines an elliptic curve over q. This is a cubic, a smooth cubic that has at least one point. Um, so it is an elliptic curve. And using the theory of elliptic curves, you can show that there are no rational solutions. So you would prove our Maslow's theorem for the exponent three, just using elliptic curves. But more interestingly, um, for this equation, which is, again, for three is an elliptic curve, but for, for higher powers are not elliptic curves. There are uh, curves of higher genus that we'll talk in a moment. Uh, it, the solution also went through elliptic curves by uh, an interesting suggestion of Heligard and then uh, elaborated by Frey that if you have an non-trivial solution of Fermat's last theorem, then we should be looking at this fabled elliptic curve. So if there is a solution, there would be this elliptic curve with a very strange property. This elliptic curve would be what we call semi-stable, but it could not be possibly modular. Um, I'm not going to define what those things are, but the, um, the last step was Wiles, Andrew Wiles and Taylor Wiles, they proved that uh, what we call the Taniyama Shimura Vey conjecture, that every elliptic curve over Q, every, uh, they prove the same as stable case that every elliptic curve is actually modular. But if this existed, there would be a non modular elliptic curve, and that would be a contradiction. Uh, so that elliptic curve cannot exist, so this solution cannot exist, and that proves Fermat's last theorem um, using elliptic curves. Now, going back to the Fantine equations and how complicated the integral solutions are. Um, one can think, okay, we, as I said, we do not have a, an algorithm for, um, um, for elliptic curves, but maybe there is an algorithm. Maybe there is an algorithm. Um, David Hilbert dream, dreamed of an algorithm that works for every Diophantine equation. So uh, Hilbert in the year 1900, at the turn of the millennium, of the turn of the, of the century, uh, he proposed a list of 23 problems. And uh, the number 10 of his problems was uh, this problem that I um, uh, stated here. To devise a process according to which it can be determined in a finite number of operations whether the equation is solvable in rational integers, so in the integers. And um, this we know how to do uh, for lines, we know how to do it in connex, but we do not know how to do it uh, with the smooth cubics for example, okay? Um, so, but that is not what uh, Hilbert asked. Hilbert asked for one algorithm that would work for all of them and not just for these, but for any Diophantine equation. Um, and whether this exists or not, that was a question that um, later in the 20th century, surprisingly was answered negatively by logicians. So lo lo the logicians seem to be um, hell-bent on giving Hilbert um, uh, an ulcer in the 20th century and several problems that he thought were, um, would, that we would find a solution the logicians showed to either be um, yeah, through the incompleteness of axioms or that one could not prove or disprove. Uh, but in the particular case of Hilbert's 10th, whether there is an algorithm to find different equations, Davis, uh, Matijasevich, Putnam, and Robinson, and Julia Robinson showed that that is not possible, that if you have a Diophantine equation over the integers, there is no algorithm that can determine whether that Diophantine equation has an integral point on it. Um, I will come back, uh, I need a little bit more about, about elliptic curves to show you how uh, elliptic curves actually play a role in this, they have a, a very, very special role to play in this question. Uh, but I need to show you a little bit more about elliptic curves first. Let's go to geometry. So why do I say that elliptic curves play, uh, they are in the sweet spot of geometry. So if you, you look at complex geometry, complex, complex algebraic geometry, or for example, curves, complex algebraic curves are classified by their genus. The genus here is the dimension of the space of regular differential one forms on the curve. So that dimension of some space of differentials 
it turns out that plays a very significant role in how we study uh, these curves. So if you have a curve that is given by an equation, we can um, think of, let's think like we were thinking before of our definite equations, let's just write our curve and suppose still that it has integer coordinates, but now we are thinking about all the complex solutions to our uh, equation. So that curve, it turns out, if once you go to the complex numbers, that is a complex manifold. And uh, according to their genus, when G is zero, when this dimension is zero, then what you get is something like a sphere. When the genus is one, you get uh, a torus or a donut uh, like this. So there is one hole. And when G is big or equal to two, you get some other complex surface uh, with uh, some G holes, okay? And it turns out that that is very much related, this classification of like this, um, these curves as complex structures has a very deep connection with the arithmetic. It turns out that if you have lines and conics, so if the degree of your curve is one or two, which corresponds to genus zero, so when your curve has genus zero, it turns out there's a dichotomy that either you have no rational points whatsoever, or you have infinitely many. And uh, once you have one, you can actually do what we call stereographic projection to find them all. Great. Um, here, in the case of cubics, uh, I wrote cubics plus because there are some degree four uh, equations that are actually by rational to, uh, in bijection to cubics, but uh, basically cubics, uh, that is the case of genus one. And this is the sweet spot of geometry because everything can happen. You can have no points whatsoever. You can have a finite amount of, uh, po of points. So you can have like 12 points and that's it. Or you can have infinitely many rational points. So this sort of var variety, that doesn't happen in any other case where you can have non-finitely many, I guess none is finitely many also, but sort of like absolutely just empty set, some finite number or infinitely many, that can only happen in the case of genus one. Great, so what about higher genus? So if the degree of your polynomial is degree, homogeneous degree higher than four, then the genus jumps to uh, two or more. And then uh, you cannot have infinitely many points. That's uh, uh, what we call the Mordell conjecture, um, which is the, uh, now a theorem of all things. Uh, and there can only be finitely many points. And in most cases, now we know also that in average, in most cases, there are no points in these, um, in these curves. So here are some examples um, that I've uh, just written down, a few examples of what happens in genus zero. So for example, this curve has no rational points, but this one has infinitely many, and we can parameterize them using stereographic projection. If the genus is one, we can have no points whatsoever. We can have, this is by the way, the Fermat case, the Fermat curve for uh, exponent three. There is actually just two rational points and one more at infinity. By the way, this is a cubic that is not in what we call via stress form at the beginning. So if you want to put in via stress form, that's the via stress form. Or you can have, like in this elliptic curve, you can have infinitely many rational points, okay? Uh, the point, uh, what is it here, 27 minus two, that's 25. So the point three, five uh, has uh, order, or you can generate out of that infinitely many points. Um, and for a uh, higher genus, for example, this is a uh, curve of genus three, and there are absolutely no rational points. And this is a curve of genus two, and it has three points and one more at infinity. Okay. So, but the beauty of elliptic curves is that out of all the curves, the curves of genus one, uh, you can put a geometric group structure. You can add points on your elliptic curves. So if you have genus one and you have at least one point, that's why elliptic curves will, will, will require at least one point that can be your zero for your group structure. So you can add things. Uh, so once you have one point, you can put a geometric group of structure on the points and uh, which is defined like Diophantus did. So if you have a point P and a point Q, 
you draw the line through P and Q, find this point, and actually for reasons so that this uh, addition is associative, for example, we reflect with respect to the axis of reflection of symmetry of the elliptic curve, and we call this point is the one that we call uh, P plus Q. Uh, if you want, you can also double points. So if you have Q, if you want to double it, then what you do is trace the tangent line, find the intersection point, reflect it, and then that point will be 2Q. And out of one point, I can find new points on my elliptic curve, okay? And using this, uh, you can find more and more points. And uh, what turns out is that, so using these laws of, uh, the, in the image behind me, you can still see that addition and doubling. Using uh, doubling and addition, if you have a number of points, then you can generate all the points that you can generate using those two operations. And what Mordell proved, Mordell proved in 1922, in fact, 100 years ago on his thesis, um, Poincaré suggested this, Poincaré sort of like thought this was um, true and Mordell proved it, that um, in an elliptic curve, there is a finite set of generators that through these uh, secant and tangent constructions, you can find all the other points. So what that means is that the set of rational points on the elliptic curve, this is how we denote all the rational points, is what we call a finely generated abelian group. There is only a finite number of generators that will generate all the rational points. And using algebra, what that tells us is that there is uh, two pieces to an elliptic curve. There is a finite group of points of finite order, which we call the torsion subgroup. And then there is a, a number of generators of infinite order, but some finite number that which we call the rank of the elliptic curve. Um, by the way, we know a lot about this group. Uh, what are the possibilities? Mazur proved that there is exactly 15 possibilities for the torsion subgroup over Q. And um, for example, Noam Elkis has shown that the rank can be uh, at least 28, uh, but we don't know any elliptic curve with a rank higher than 28. And there is sort of like this controversy or this uh, back and forth between mathematicians, people who think that ranks should be or will be um, unbounded, uh, can be arbitrarily large, or people that have proposed heuristics that say, that the rank is actually bounded. There's uh, a limit of how big the rank can be. And um, maybe 28 is the largest rank, who knows? Um, okay. So um, now that we know about ranks, let me talk to you about um, Hilbert's 10th again. So Hilbert's 10th problem, remember it was whether there is an algorithm to find a, Diffantine, a solution to a Diffantine equation to determine whether there is a solution in the integers of a Diffantine equation over the integers. So you can change the ring of definition of your, uh, of your Diffantine equation. So for example, if you replace the integers by the Gaussian uh, integers, so by A plus BI with A and B integers and I square equals minus one, this is a new ring. And now you can ask, is there an algorithm to determine if Diffantine equations over Z join I have a solution over Z join I? And that is a very different problem. That's a different problem that Hilbert's 10th and the solution of Matijasevich and company does not apply here directly. So we have this question and it turns out that elliptic curves play a very significant role here to decide Hilbert's 10th over all the rings. So uh, work of Deneuf, uh, Fetus, uh, Shalambatak and uh, Poonen imply the following. Suppose you have a number field F. Inside a number field, a number field can be, for example, Q adjoint I, um, so the Gaussian numbers, and inside that there is a Gaussian integers. So for example, for Q adjoint I, if there is an elliptic curve over uh, Q such that when you go up to that other field and look at how many rational points are over this new field, if it turns out that the rank is the same over Q than over this field and the ranks are equal one, then there is no algorithm over the ring of integers of that number field. So here I have an example of an elliptic curve. This is an elliptic curve over Q, and the rank over Q is one. But if you go up to this larger field, Q adjoint I, the rank is still one. And therefore, uh, Hilbert 10 
is also not solvable over the adjoint I. There is no such algorithm. So, uh, so it turns out then that you can solve if these elliptic curves exist, which we think they exist for every number field F, we think there is such an elliptic curve and the people have proved it in many cases now, um, then we know that Hilbert's 10th uh, will also be false over those ring of integers. So here is a, a very interesting connection of elliptic curves about all Diophantine equations. All right, how about in, the, in complex analysis? Um, they also play a fantastic role in complex analysis um, in the theory of Riemann surfaces. So that is a central object of study in complex analysis, that's that of a Riemann surface, uh, which is a connected one-dimensional complex manifold. So get, let me give you an example of a compact, so a complex manifold, for example, the complex plane is a complex manifold, um, and a compact Riemann surface uh, this is not compact if you just think of the complex numbers. So what we do is a one-point compactification. Think of the complex numbers wrapping up and just leaving one point at infinity and then add one more point at infinity. That gives me what we call the Riemann sphere. And uh, that is a one-point compactification of the complex numbers and it gives you uh, um, a Riemann surface that is compact. And it turns out um, uh, an amazing fact is that compact Riemann surfaces, this complex manifold, so any complex manifold that is compact, connected, and one dimensional, it turns out there are imbijection with complex and smooth projective algebraic curves. So, for example, this compactification of the complex plane corresponds to just the line, the projective line over the complex numbers, uh, which is, by the way, uh, when, when we talked about genus of algebraic curves, this is a genus zero algebraic curve. So what happened? What other compact Riemann surfaces are there? We have classified them. Um, so um, here's another source of Riemann surfaces that are compact are the following. You take the complex plane, you draw a lattice. So this sort of like, you see these points that forms a lattice on the plane. Um, I'm going to generate lattices by one and tau, uh, some complex number tau. And if you do the quotient of the entire complex plane by that lattice, you get what is another um, Riemann surface that is of flat curvature. So it's of zero curvature. And it turns out by what we call the uniformization theorem is that every Riemann surface like this is actually an elliptic curve. There is an elliptic curve as a complex algebraic curve, an elliptic curve, genus one, that uh, is in correspondence with this Riemann surface that is isomorphic to that Riemann surface as complex manifolds. Uh, you can do other structures in the uh, compact Riemann surfaces. The other complex Riemann, Riemann surfaces come from um, quotients of the hyperbolic plane. So you take the upper uh, complex plane, and then if you have a friction group acting on that complex plane, uh, you do the quotient, and these ones that have negative, the ones with negative curvature, those correspond to the curves of genus uh, bigger or equal to two. And uh, those are the rest of Riemann surfaces. So the fact that these ones, the only ones that have zero curvature, are the elliptic curve that makes elliptic curves play a very important role. But it turns out that even for the higher genus uh, Riemann surfaces, elliptic curves also play a role. So it turns out that if you start with one of these quotients and you look at the holomorphic differential forms in here, that leads to the concept of modular forms attached to this function group. And it turns out that in, in some special cases, but in many cases, these modular forms actually correspond to elliptic curves themselves, which is part of the modularity, um, which was part of the proof of Vermaslav's theorem. So elliptic curves actually are sort of like pieces of the complex structure of these uh, higher genus uh, curves. By the way, uh, this concept of modular forms has also been elaborated in uh, direct topology um, by Hopkins, Nahold, and Miller to define what they call the uh, um, topological modular forms. So there is some sort of uh, analog of elliptic curves or modular forms in algebraic topology here. 
Uh, by the way, there is also a very cool relationship between these and uh, art, which is that if you take out the, the circle model of the hyperbolic plane and you, you do, uh, you look at, um, um, uh, you look at geodesics in the plane, then you can do tessellations of the complex plane. And for example, Escher, uh, the artist has like very cool uh, um, uh, pictures that he did using this concept uh, from the uh, from these quotients of the hyperbolic plane. All right. So in the sweet spot, by the way, um, so going back to uh, elliptic curves, remember, so quotients of the complex plane by lattices are over just up to isomorphism of these Riemann surfaces. They are in correspondence to elliptic curves of the complex numbers under isomorphism, and we can actually parameterize all of them. It turns out there is one elliptic curve for the complex numbers for each complex number. Uh, and uh, I can actually tell you how to go from one to the other. So if you have a, a Riemann surface like this, then it turns out there is a formula for the elliptic curve that it is isomorphic to using what we call elliptic functions. And giving an, ellipt uh, an elliptic curve, you can actually uh, give a complex number that tells you what is the complex isomorphism um, type of that elliptic curve, which is called the J-invariant, which is also given by uh, these elliptic functions. And uh, so the J-invariant, because it's some uh, periodic function, you can actually give it a Fourier expansion in terms of e to the two pi i tau, and you have um, what we call the Q expansion of the J-invariant, which again is just a, a Fourier expansion of the modular J-invariant that classifies elliptic curves up to isomorphism. But it turns out there is a very surprising and amazing connection to group theory that was discovered in 1978 by John McKay. Uh, what he discovered is that the numbers that appear, not only 144, although that appears in other uh, cases of this theory, um, these numbers, are actually um, sums of linear combinations of the dimensions of irreducible representations of the monster group, um, which is the largest of the sporadic um, finite simple groups um, in, in group theory. So this amazing connection um, was just, um, just like blew people's minds. Uh, this was called the uh, monstrous moonshine that somehow the monster group is shining in here. You can see some um, reflections of it in the Jane variant somehow. And uh, later Conway and Norton came up with a specific uh, conjecture of why this was happening. And Borchertz proved that connection in 1992, uh, earning him a Fields Medal for that uh, particular work on moonshine. Okay. Uh, by the way, I, I wanted to go back to the number e to the pi a square root of 163. It turns out that this elliptic curve is to blame for that. This elliptic curve, uh, the tau for the lattice is this tau. And if you put this tau here, then you get that this number is this number. And it has to be very close to an integer because the theory, the theory of complex multiplication, which this elliptic curve has complex multiplication, tells you that this number is an integer. So this number has to be very close to an integer. These are very small numbers. Uh, so it explains that. By the way, there is more connections between, um, between these lattices and art. Uh, there is a, a very beautiful picture of Escher where there is this guy is in a gallery looking at a painting. And in the painting, there is a, a harbor. And in the harbor, there's a gallery. And in the gallery, there is a person looking at the painting. So this painting that is sort of so amazing uh, Escher did not complete the painting. There was a step missing in there. I'm not sure if he just didn't know how to complete it, but the Smith and Lenstra using elliptic curves, thinking of this as uh, drawn on an elliptic curve, uh, it turns out that uh, they were able to complete the picture. So you see they, they were able to complete the drawing using elliptic curves. Okay, um, let me just talk uh, very briefly how long do I have? Like another five minutes? Another five minutes is fine, yes. Uh, but we have to finish by seven, so good. Great, thank you. So um, by the way, so given an elliptic curve, how do you find this tau? 
it turns out that this tau has to do with line integrals on this uh, elliptic curve. Uh, and that brings me to actually, um, why are elliptic curves elliptic? Why are they called elliptic? Uh, are they related to, ellip to um, ellipses? So it turns out that in physics, uh, ellip uh, ellipses uh, were uh, very hot in the 1600s due to Ke uh, Kepler's laws. So Kepler, um, Kepler's law says that planets move in elliptical orbits around the sun. So it is uh, natural to ask to compute arc lengths of, um, of ellipses. So Newton, Euler, and many others computed such things in terms of infinite, infinite series. But later, people started to wonder how to actually write them in terms of integrals. So if you want to find the circumference of an ellipse, this is the integral that gives you that. And if you make a change of variables, you get to this integral. And it turns out this integral, you see this a square root of this. What it means is that you are doing an integral on an elliptic curve, sort of one of these periods, uh, one of these integrals that I was talking about before is what is happening here, that defined the length around, of, uh, uh, around an ellipsis, the circumference, what you're doing is an integral on an elliptic curve. Uh, similarly, you can actually do arc length. So put uh, this as a function of the angle that you're going by. And this function, if you, Jacobi and Abel, what they did is, is study the inverse function. In terms of the inverse function, the inverse functions are elliptic functions, elliptic functions that came up when we were trying to go from lattices to elliptic curves. Uh, more recently, though, in the later 1900s, in string theory, elliptic curves also show up in physics because the string theory needs higher dimensions. So its string theory says that the universe at the very most, uh, so the fabric of the universe is on Calabi-Yau manifolds, maybe a six dimensionals, maybe 23 dimensionals, depending on the string theory theory. And uh, well, in physics, they love studying vibrations of strings. That's a very classical topic. Well, if you try to vibrate a string, what do you usually uh, or when you try to study motions of particles, you look at closed loops. So if we do a closed loop of a string, what we get is, well, there is an elliptic curve that is the entire motion of the string. And then you, what you want to do is, well, try to analyze what sort of vibrations you could have, a string could have in a Calabi-Yau. So how do elliptic curves fit in Calabi-Yau's? And that brings a lot of questions and string theory that are related to um, the algebraic geometry of elliptic curves in higher dimensional varieties. Uh, finally, I just wanted to mention the relation to Bitcoin uh, in the last minute. In complexity theory, the elliptic curves have a very um, natural sweet spot in there. Uh, and it comes from uh, the advent of public cri cryptography and public key exchange, where you have some public keys that are combined to a shared secret key. Um, Diffie and Hellman came up with an algorithm to do this kind of uh, sharing of keys. Uh, let me just, um, I'll, I'll have these slides will be available in my website so you can go back to them. But uh, there is a way just on integers modulo P on how to uh, give out some public key and that can be used to compute a private key. And the strength here is the discrete log problem that is very difficult. If I just give you A, a power of a number modulo P, it's very difficult to figure out what was the number I raised a power to, or what was the exponent in here uh, when P is very large. And uh, now we want to replace the integers modulo P by other groups that offer efficiency, but also greater security. If you start from a abstract group, uh, using algebraic groups is natural because, well, if it's an algebraic, if it's given by some algebraic equations, it's easy to store those equations on a computer. And algebraic groups with a uh, with a group structure that naturally leads to abelian varieties, of which the dimension one are elliptic curves. And in fact, higher dimensional varieties they just they don't offer a lot of greater security in terms of like the balance between efficiency and greater security. According to cryptographers, it seems that elliptic curves is really the sweet spot of that 
uh, balance between efficiency and greater security. So you can replace the role of Z modulo, modulo P and the Diffie-Hellman by an elliptic curve and create uh, uh, secret keys that are using um, these, these elliptic curves. So for example, uh, WhatsApp uses such security. Um, let me just say that, well, factorization also um, elliptic curves plays a role, but uh, in particular, Bitcoin and PS3, what happened is that they were using some form of uh, digital signature that is also uh, related to elliptic curves, but the, in the implementation, you have to be careful. There's this exponent K that um, you have to choose. And um, in both cases, that implementation was not uh, done correctly, which led to um, vulnerabilities that were able, people were able to break this digital signature uh, that comes from elliptic curve cryptography. So in any case, uh, are elliptic curves in the sweet spot? Maybe it's just uh, the law of small numbers. We are in many of these areas where the, in the infancy of mathematics in how we are still studying the Daffentine equations of very low degree number of variables, Riemann surfaces of low genus, abelian varieties of low dimensions, weak computing power, all those small numbers lead to uh, elliptic curves. But maybe as mathematics grows a little um, wiser, uh, we will uh, step out of this sweet spot of elliptic curves into um, realms of other higher dimensional abelian varieties. Okay, so I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for this very interesting and very clear talk. Uh, I would like to open the floor for uh, our attendees. If you have any questions, please, uh, you can raise your hand and you can take the stage. Yeah, I, 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 just, would to, I, I would love to answer any questions. questions by the audience. Uh, I have a question, uh, Kamal, Kamal, you can go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was just applauding. I enjoyed the talk a lot. I don't have any added questions to ask right now. Let me see if I can come up with some. Thank you. I, I actually have a question for you. At the beginning, you mentioned in the book four of the Aphantis about the number where you can write as a sum of two numbers such that their product is a cube minus X. What is the motivation for that, actually? Is there any geometric motivation or just... For the problem itself, yeah, um, I don't. I I I would have to look back to see what the problems before that are, but it 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 really seems that are the problems in Diophantus are not very well motivated. Um, there are many problems that are just sort of like strange problems, just like that. The statement seems strange, and I wonder. I'm not a I'm not a historian, um, but I wonder if, like, for example, many of these problems were probably floating around. Um, many of these problems come from challenges from one mathematician to another. Do you know how to find this? Because I know how to do it. Do you know how to do this? So some of these problems that to us all of a sudden they just seem like completely unmotivated. Some of these problems were around for a long time before people solved them. For example. Um, the problem of the congruent number problem that I mentioned Fibonacci was challenged to solve. That mm. problem had been around for hundreds of years and it appears in other parts and other texts and other like uh, um, documents that have survived. So some of these problems were problems that maybe either people didn't know how to solve at the time or they knew how to solve, but the Fentus finds a better solution. So that, that's my explanation for some, some of these. I don't think there was, um, there is a, a very clear motivation of why this particular problem, for example, he was trying to solve. Sometimes it seems like he's solving the problems he knows how to solve. I see, I see, okay, thanks, thanks. Any other questions from our speak from our attendees, from the audience? Okay, okay, thank you very much, actually. And uh, looking forward to having you here in Beirut, so. I would I'd love, love to come. Okay, okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Okay, bye. <laughs>